Hello students, this is our third lecture on chapter 2 of our book Indian Economic Development. In our last lecture, we were discussing the agriculture sector. Today, we will elaborate it more. We will look here that what was happening at the time of independence in agriculture sector. Actually, at the time of independence, there were three types of land tenure systems prevailing in the country. The Jamindari system, the Ryotwari system and the Mahalwari system. In all these systems, ultimately farmer was exploited. Only the method of collecting rent of land revenue was different. So, many reforms took place. First among them is land reform. Land reforms is primarily concerned with the change in ownership of land holdings, which can improve the performance of entire agriculture sector. Today, under the heading land reform, we have divided these reforms into five categories. First is abolition of intermediaries. Second is land sealing. Third is regulation of rent. Fourth is consolidation of land holdings. And fifth is cooperative farming. Now, we will do these five reforms one by one. First is abolition of intermediaries. It requires that Jamindari or Jagirdari system should be abolished and tenants should be brought into direct contact with the government so that farmers may not be exploited by the Jamindars. Land sealing was another policy towards land reforms. Land sealing means fixing the maximum size of land which could be owned by an individual. And beyond that limit, the land would be taken over by the government. And this excess land would be allotted to the landless farmers. Purpose behind land sealing was to reduce the concentration of land ownership in a few hands. And now, current land sealing is 18 acres of wetland or 54 acres of unirrigated land which a family could hold. But in some areas, even today, the former Jamindas continue to hold large areas of land by making use of loophole in this law. Another land reform was in the form of regulation of rent. In this policy, rents were fixed in order to avoid illegal extortions on the cultivators as we have said that earlier the Jamindas charged interest rate at the rate of 18% to 50%. Next land reform was consolidation of land holdings. It was done to solve the problem of fragmentation and subdivision of land holdings. Accordingly, it was decided to consolidate holdings by giving to the farmer one consolidated holding equal to the total of the land in different scattered plots under his possession. And next reform under land reform is cooperative farming, which improves the bargaining power of the small landholders and encourages competitive market structure. Cooperative farming helps them to work in cooperation and enjoy the benefits of consolidation of land holdings. Concludingly, the result of five land reforms was that this practice was successful in Kerala and West Bengal. Because the government of these states was committed to the policy, but unfortunately, other states did not have the same level of commitment and vast inequality in land holding continues even today. These were the land reforms. Now, second reforms in the agriculture sector were in the nature of technical reform. Under the heading technical reforms, the concept of green revolution is studied. Now, question arises, what is this green revolution? So, green revolution means large increase in production of food grains resulting from the use of high yielding variety seeds, especially for the production of wheat and rice, most commonly known as high yielding varieties program. High yielding variety seeds means using those seeds which give more return, which give more yield. It requires the use of fertilizers and pesticides in the correct quantities as well as regular supply of water in correct proportions. This green revolution is divided into two phases. 
The first phase is between the period 1960s to mid 1970s. The use of high yielding variety seeds was restricted to some states only like Punjab, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. High yielding varieties program was restricted to five crops only namely wheat, rice, bajra, jowar and maize. But among these increase in wheat's production was remarkable. Wheat's production increased by about seven times. And in the second phase of the green revolution during mid 1970s to mid 1980s high yielding variety programs technology spread to a larger number of states. Spread of green revolution technology made us self-sufficient in food grains. Now we are not dependent on America or any other nation for meeting our food requirements. This is green revolution which give us so much benefits. Like first is marketable surplus. It means farmers started to sold agricultural produce in the market after fulfilling their own consumption requirements. That is the farmers combined the concept of subsistence farming that is self-consumption with commercialization of agriculture which improved their financial position. Secondly, green revolution resulted in multiple rise in food production especially the crop of wheat. Sometimes green revolution is largely said as wheat revolution. Third benefit emerged from green revolution is increase in productivity. Productivity is continuously increasing due to the use of high yielding variety seeds. The adoption of green revolution increased the income of farmers. It increased the status of farmers. India becomes self-sufficient due to green revolution. Many industries also established and started to producing chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, machinery, etc. Therefore, there was a positive impact of green revolution on the overall industrial development of the economy. But if there are merits, there are demerits also. This green revolution also suffered many shortcomings like the focus of green revolution was only on limited crops. It has little effect on commercial crops like tea, rubber, jute, etc. As we said, green revolution was centralized only to some states. So, effect of green revolution has been only in Punjab, Haryana, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh. Green revolution increased the income inequalities in the villages. The rich farmers earned more revenues as compared to poor farmers because of lack of funds with them. We were discussing the second reform in agriculture sector in the form of green revolution. First was land reform, second was technical reform in the form of green revolution. Now third reforms fall under the category of general reforms which involves credit facilities to the agriculture sector, irrigation facilities, organized marketing system and minimum price. First, credit facilities. Credit facilities are in the form of financial reforms. National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development commonly known as NABARD N -A -B -A -R -D, was established in 1982 to provide loan and finance to farmers at cheaper rates. Commercial banks also started to cater to the needs of the farmers. At present, irrigational facilities cover 43% of land under cultivation as compared to only 15% in 1950. Dry farming techniques has also been encouraged and is in practice by many farmers. Because we have earlier said that about 60% of our crop was destroyed by floods because there were no dry farming techniques but now we have. There are regular markets established in all the parts of the country. Government has set up market committees which help farmers to get remunerative price for their produce. In the minimum support price policy as already discussed above, government guarantees a price higher than the market price 
and if farmers are not able to sell their entire production at increased price, government offers to buy it at increased price. Government keeps this surplus in its stock and uses it during the time of emergencies like flood, famine, drought, earthquake, etc. During the period 1950s to 1990s, proportion of GDP contributed by agriculture declined significantly, but there was no decline in the population depending on it. That is, 67.5% population was dependent on agriculture in 1950 and 64.9% in 1990, approximately the same. So, this entire discussion was about the agriculture sector. Now, we will discuss some aspect of industrial sector. Because our Indian economy is divided into three occupational sector, primary sector, secondary sector and tertiary sector. Agriculture was the part of primary sector, now secondary sector. We will discuss why industrial sector is important for our economy. The five-year plans place a lot of emphasis on industrial development because a nation cannot progress if the industrial base is not strong. It is the industrial sector which promotes modernization and overall prosperity of an economy. Employment provided by this industrial sector is more stable than employment in agriculture sector. As we know, at the time of independence, the variety of industry was very limited, largely confined to cotton textile and jute. At that time, we had only two big iron and steel firms one in Jamshedpur and the other in Kolkata. But after independence, we needed to expand our industrial base as it is of utmost importance for the economic growth of an economy. As we know, no country can avoid industrialization since every country is desirous of rapid economic development. The economic history of advanced countries also shows that industrialization is the pre-requirement for rapid economic growth. The development of industries is important due to the following reasons. First, shifting from primary sector to secondary sector and tertiary sector is very important for economic growth of the nation because agriculture is the main occupation of an underdeveloped country, not of developing or developed economy. Industrialization is important to solve the problem of disguised unemployment, which is a common feature of agriculture. And disguised unemployment is a waste of human energy. Therefore, it is urgent and necessary to go for industrialization. Industrialization is important to generate employment opportunities. We have to expand our industrial base so that Excess labor force could be absorbed as industrial provides stable employment than agricultural. It is industry that promotes modernization, growth, high national income and high per capita income. Industrialization is also important because with the growth of industrial sector, the basic infrastructure like road, dams, banking also develop, which further fastens the growth rate of industrial development and growth of the whole economy. Due to industrialization, urbanization increases. Industries help in building a sound base for a self-reliant economy. Industries like electricity, communication, chemical industries help in achieving the objective of self-reliance. In India, our industrial sector is owned both by private sector and public sector. The policy makers thought that industries should not be left only in the hands of private sector as they were at the time of independence. So, they thought that government should also have some control on industries. Role of government was considered important in industrial sector due to the following reasons. Motive of social justice and public welfare is not found in private sector as their ultimate goal is profit maximization. And this goal of profit maximization leads to income inequalities in the economy. And this income inequality retards the growth of economy. 
so it was necessary that industrial sector should be given to public sector in private sector there was a lack of capital to undertake investment at the time of independence indian private industrialist did not have sufficient capital to invest in industrial project due to which government had to undertake capital investment through public sector undertakings commonly known as psus it shows that private and public sector are complementary in leading the path of progress only in the hands of private sector or only in the hands of public sector we can't progress these both are complementary now industrial policy resolution ipr was passed in 1956 this ipr was the basis of second five year plan the plan which tried to build the basis for a socialistic pattern of society features of ipr were that industries were classified into three categories as per industrial policy resolution in the first category those industries fall which were exclusively owned by the government that is those industries which were reserved for the public sector and these were 17 like atomic energy railways etc but only three industries are reserved for public sector in the present era in the second category of industries those private industries fall which supplement the efforts of state sector but for starting new units government had sole responsibility it included 12 industries like fertilizers machine tools etc and lastly in the third category those industries fall which were owned by private sector but these industries were under control of government through industries development and regulation act 1951 This was all the first feature of IPR that is classification of industry now the second feature of IPR is no doubt some industries could be owned by private sector but still there was a need to obtain a license from government to start any industry license was given if the industry was to be established in an economically backward area so that regional equality is promoted even an already existed industry had to obtain license for producing a new variety of goods this restriction was imposed to check that production was not more than what the economy required license to produce more was given only if the government was convinced that the country requires a larger quantity of goods now the last third feature of ipr is industrial concession concession in the form of tax benefit and electricity at a lower tariff to encourage establishing their units in the backward regions of the country to promote regional equality so students we keep our lecture till it the remaining chapter we will do in our next lecture let's revise today's work we completed the agriculture sector and started the industrial sector we discussed the importance of industries and industrial policy resolution so it was all for today thank you